Yesterday, I uh, did kind of part one of this talk, quick introduction to the extended type system in PowerShell and the uh, common type system which it's built on, the type system of .NET. Uh, I have to uh, apologize both on my own behalf and on behalf of the organizers. Um, there was a bit of a scheduling conflict yesterday. As I was giving a talk that kind of um, gave a very quick introduction to the extended type system in, in Sorry? Oh, of course. Timing is everything. Uh, as I was giving a presentation, I kind of touched briefly on what the extended type system was. Uh, my friend uh, Stefan was in the next room giving the presentation on what the extended type system uh, is. So if I, if I kind of lured anyone away from that, I'd say, go back home, watch his presentation. He really knows what he's talking about when it comes to the extended type system. And it's really interesting stuff, I think, at least. Um, Someone asked me yesterday, can I attend part two when I didn't see part one? Sure, we'll do like a very quick recap of what we talked about yesterday. Uh, some of the uh, kind of themes I tried to introduce. Um, and so the agenda for today is going to be a quick recap of what we did yesterday. Um, gonna explore a little more about the common type system, uh, what kinds of types you have in, in the type system that .NET uh, uses the uh, logical structure uh, of type data in .NET. Uh, then we're going to have a, a kind of a brief uh, introduction to, to reflection in .NET. Uh, we're going to look at the get type. Uh, we're going to look at the uh, um, type comparison operators in PowerShell. Uh, and then finally, at the end, uh, we're going to look at what kind of led me to give this talk here. Um, um, looking at how we can kind of emit new types, define new types, define new classes at runtime. Both what we have natively in PowerShell and what we can kind of hack our way into using the underlying um, .NET framework. Uh, once again, disclaimer, I have no idea what I'm doing. So uh, if I say anything that doesn't make any sense, you know, feel free to call me out, ask questions. Um, the great thing is that we're at a PowerShell conference. There are pl plenty of other experts around here that can pr probably give even better answers to some of these questions than I can. So first, a quick recap of uh, what I talked about yesterday. Basically, I posed the question, what is a type system? And the conclusion was that a type system, at least in the context of, of computer, program, uh, computer programs and, and programming languages, is a set of rules that govern how, how types, how data types that we operate on, uh, how they behave. Uh, the, the primary aim of trying to define um, type systems in, in programming languages and programming environments is primarily to reduce runtime errors. We want to make sure that when someone sits down, writes some code, they try to compile it into something that the computer can understand. They get a warning already then, rather than when they try to run their program and all of their computers catch on fire, because, you know, we'd rather not want that. Uh, implementing strict type systems has some, some kind of side effects and benefits um, uh, related to memory optimization, a bunch of other, other stuff. Um, um, we can get some nicer performance characteristics uh, out of our programs, you know, if we're using it for the for the right kind of thing. Um, and in a bunch of high-level languages, we get uh, we get an aspect called uh, reflection, which we're going to dive into a little bit. Uh, a type system also usually in, includes kind of a, a core set of types, a minimum set of types that a language needs to implement to kind of function. Uh, we're going to look at a little bit of. of um, at what that looks like in, in, in .NET and, and the languages compiled against .NET. And type systems also usually include extensible types. That is, whoever invented the programming languages has had a bunch of data types in mind that you can operate on, like kind of out of the box. But we can also kind of extend the type system. We can define our, our own type, uh, type definitions. Um, with that in mind, PowerShell has something called the extended type system that builds upon .NET's built-in type system. Uh, this is kind of a mock-up diagram of, of what goes into the, uh, the PS object. Uh, this is a type that basically wraps everything in the PowerShell console. 
Uh, again, if you want to know more about this, uh, I'm sure Stefan has a way better explanation in his talk, so go back and watch that on YouTube once you get home. Uh, but basically, the, the idea is that we should be able to take any, any object of any type from a number of subsystems, not just the .NET, but also um, um, a, a COM service on your machine, uh, an XML file, uh, all these nice, nice things that we can kind of uh, work with using native syntax in, in .NET. Um, this is all enabled by this PS object layer model and the extended type system. Um, we did a brief demo. This is kind of an unnecessary slide, but I really love this picture. Um, uh, looked at the dollar profile variable, uh, why it behaves the way it does, why it looks like it is a string, but it isn't actually a string. Again, courtesy of the extended type system in PowerShell. Now, the underlying type system, the one we get from .NET, the, the type system that isn't specific to PowerShell, basically the design philosophy uh, was heavily borrowed from what uh, Java was trying to do in the JVM. Uh, when this was first invented, uh, almost 20 years ago. But the idea is basically that you should be able to code in any language, right? You should be able to write your code, um, uh, uh, define your functions, define your classes in any language that compiles against .NET, and then reuse that code from any other language that compiles against .NET. And so the example I showed yesterday is that we could define a type, we could write some code in, C uh, in F Sharp, which is not C Sharp, it's another language, right? We could reuse that in C Sharp, another .NET language, and we could in turn reuse all of this code in PowerShell, even though it was written in a bunch of different languages, which is kind of nifty. So if, if you have a developer on your team who says, I don't really like C Sharp, or I don't want to you know, code in your PowerShell weird scripting language, you know, he can use F Sharp or VB.NET, and then you know, run that um, in PowerShell. It's kind of nice, gives a bunch of flexibility. Um, the, the kind of conceptual model of this, again, shown here, a uh, very dated slide, it says J-sharp, I'm pretty sure that uh, that's been deprecated for a long time, but again, the idea that um, you have a separate compiler that takes code in some language and then compiles it against something called the common language infrastructure to an intermediate language called the common intermediate language. Um, in .NET, um, the implementation of this common intermediate language is called uh, the Microsoft Intermediate Language. So whenever in uh, reversing tools or uh, reflection tools or debuggers or editors, you see, you see a reference to MSIL, MSIL. Uh, this is this intermediate language that everything kind of compiles down to and then we can kind of interact with it regardless of what it was originally written in. And then it can kind of all run on the common language, language runtime which is kind of the, the JVM of .NET. And so this is kind of where it all comes together, and you know, we can interoperate with um, code yeah, written from a bunch of, of different languages. So, back to .NET, .NET type system. Um, I think I mentioned yesterday, but kind of failed to clarify that uh, the common type system has uh, Two kind of um, two kinds of types. Um, we have something called value types. Uh, these are sometimes um, uh, broken into primitive types and composite types. The primitive types are basically the types that are are built into the uh, the type system itself. So we have a number of numerical types, like an integer. Um, uh, we have multiple types of integers, 16-bit, 32-bit, 64-bit. We have a byte type that represents a single byte. We have a Boolean that can represent a true-false value. Uh, and then we have uh, some composite types, uh, like enums, just like we have in PowerShell. Uh, and then something called structs. Uh, structs are a little bit like classes. Uh, but again, the difference here is that we call them value types rather than reference types. And the difference between value types and reference types is that when you assign a value type to a new variable, it gets copied to that variable. Instead of us creating a new reference to the same object in, in the VM or in the CLR, we create a copy of that object. And so um, a command like get date, for example, uh, returns an object of type, type date time. 
at date time is a struct. So when you, when you do get date, assign that to you know, dollar $date, and then assign that to a bunch of other variables, it gets copied every time we assign them to a new variable. So you can modify one variable, and the others will be kind of untouched, even though we all got them from a single call to get date. Uh, finally, kind of the, the second sphere of the type system deals with uh, what we call reference types, and these are basically classes. Uh, these are kind of the, the more complex types that we use to define business processes or, um, or you know, types that kind of extend the functionality of, of the primitive types of the comp composite types. Uh, what's funny is that on, on this slide, the value types kind of take up a lot of space because you know, we have the primitive types, we have composite types, people kind of uh, recognize this, and then we just have this big blob called classes. Uh, but most of what we use and what we care about is actually down here, right? Um, uh, anything you know, more cl complex than a number or a daytime, or a daytime struct or something like that uh, is usually a class. .NET, uh, logically, um, uh, kind of structures all of these components, these type definitions, um, uh, like this. Um, the idea is that you can attach a namespace to a type uh, so that you don't have collisions between your type names. Uh, this is why a string is not just a string. The type of a string is actually called system.string. It's kind of at the root of the system na namespace. A uh, namespace can contain classes, enums, structs, so these type definitions. Uh, classes can in turn contain nested type definitions, so a nested class or a nested enum or a nested struct. Uh, what I kind of tried to illustrate on, on the bottom here is that, um, is anyone here familiar with Java? Have used Java as a, as a development language? A few, few people, okay. So in Java, when you define a, a uh, when you define a class in Java, uh, or a package, which is kind of the equivalent to a namespace, uh, Java's pretty strict about how you group your files on the file system, and there's kind of a one-to-one -one relationship between a class and kind of what it compiles to. Uh, .NET doesn't really care about that. You can compile a bunch of classes in the same namespace into multiple files on disk, right? So when you have a DLL file that's compiled from code, um, and the DLL file is called something like you know, system.namespace. That does not mean that that DLL contains that, all the classes in that namespace. You can split that over, over multiple files. So, with that in mind, um, I want to not talk too much about reflection, but I want to try to interact with it. Can you see this? It's okay? All right. So I think I mentioned yesterday that uh, every, every, single, every single object in the uh, .NET type system extends from something called system.object. Uh, this is kind of at, at, the, at the root of the, uh, of the type hierarchy. And that means that um, every single other type um, inherits all the um, all the methods, all the codes that, that's already defined for system.object. And system.object has um, a couple of methods. Uh, we can look at those by calling get members. Um, I think I'm going to do get methods here. We get a bunch of information about these methods. I just want the name. And so here we can see that system.object, uh, kind of the thing that everything inherits from, everything extends. Uh, contains a, an equals method, a get type med method, a to string method. This is why everything can be con uh, converted to a string pretty easily in, in PowerShell and in .NET. Um, uh, reference equals, and then get hash code. Uh, get hash code is, is used to determine whether two objects are the same in memory. Uh, I mentioned before that classes are reference types, right? So when you have a variable, you don't actually have the value of a class, you have a reference to some region in memory that holds that class. And so get hash, co hash code is basically um, uh, used to tell us whether two references to an object of the same type is actually the same, the same object in memory. 
And so, since everything uh, kind of extends or inherits from system.object, uh, any other type uh, will expose these methods equals get type to string reference equals and, and get hash method, or get, get hash code. Uh, so that means that when, when I have, let's say, an integer, I can call to string, it's the same representation as the literal, the literal integer, um, but I could, I could do that with any type. Uh, what's interesting here is uh, the getType method. Uh, the fact that every single type or every single object in .NET has a getType method means that we can write some code that can inspect what any kind of object actually is, right? We can reflect against it and figure out what the nature of it is. So if I have a string here and I say get type, it's going to show me what type the object itself is, what its immediate base type is, the object that it inherited from, in this case, uh, system.object. PowerShell also has two operators, the is and is not operator. So if I do something like this, I can say dash is string, and PowerShell will tell me that, yeah, sure, your empty string over here is an object of type string. The, the problem with the is operator that is that it is recursive. So I showed before that um, a string is a string, but it extends from system.object. So from, from kind of the perspective of the is operator, a string is both a string and a system.object. So if, if I were to do something like this instead, uh, system.object, it's also going to return true, right? So this comparison right here is always going to be true for any object that you can compare. Uh, and so this could get you into some trouble if you're trying to figure out what a variable that was passed into your function, for example, uh, what type it is, because uh, depending on what type it is, you may uh, want to do something different, right? Uh, so rather than the is operator, if you want to know like what the exact type of something is, uh, you might want to use the uh, um, uh, get type, right? Because if I say get type equals string, this is still true, but this is no longer true because the string type is not exactly a uh, system.object. Uh, similarly, we can use the uh, is not operator. Um, if we want to figure out that something is not a number, okay, a string is not a number, or a string is not an integer. Um, uh, one is an integer, but if we cast this to another numerical type, so let's say bytes, it's, it tells us that it's no longer an, an integer, right? So now I want to get to kind of the, the real meat of this talk, um, emitting types at runtime. What, you know, okay, what does that even mean? Um, if you break out a language like uh, C Sharp, F Sharp, uh, VB.NET, you can write a bunch of code, you can compile it, right, and then you can use that to define new classes. In uh, PowerShell 2.0, uh, we, we had the introduction of the add type uh, commandlet, and the add type commandlet uh, is super flexible. It allows us to import uh, new assemblies, new DLLs into, the, uh, um, into PowerShell. Uh, it, it allows us to uh, operate with uh, uh, native APIs, but it also allows us to basically compile C sharp code on the fly. So if I want to define a new type, if I want to define a new class on the fly, I simply write my class definition in C sharp. So as you can see up there, um, I'm not using the, uh, the, uh, the pound or the hash uh, as, a, as a comment. I'm using slash slash because the string up there is not actually PowerShell. It's C sharp, right? So when I run this command, add type, type definition, and then public class my class, um, add type is going to emit and import into, into PowerShell a new type called my class. In, in PowerShell 5.0, 
um, we got this new feature called classes, which allows us to use PowerShell's own syntax to define new classes at runtime. And so uh, here in this example, we have a, a simple calculator. It does two things. It adds numbers. It subtracts numbers. Um, I was at the PowerShell Summit uh, in Seattle last week, and someone mentioned um, that one of the most annoying kind of features or behaviors of PowerShell is the return keyword, because a lot of people expect the return keyword to return a value of some sort, right? But if you write a function in PowerShell and you just leave a bunch of objects in there, they kind of bubble up to the pipeline. And so by the end you get to your return statement, you may also al already have a bunch of output that you didn't expect. Whereas if you did this in a language like C-sharp or VB.net, uh, you would only actually get the value back um, that is defined right after the return keyword. So uh, PowerShell 5.0, um, in order to kind of uh, adhere to this contract, you can see we kind of have a type literal before the method name. Um, so we're telling PowerShell that this method should always return an object of this type, in this case an integer, when someone tries to call this method. Uh, method. And so we can't have a bunch of objects bubbling kind of back up the pipeline or, or, or back to the caller. And so in this case down here, subtract, I kind of just drop a string in there. We have some garbage in there. That's not actually going to go anywhere. That's just going to go away. It's going to get swallowed by the runtime. And the only value that's going to be returned by, by this subtract method is the, um, yes? So, so in this case, in, in my class, uh, we, can, we, can, we can show this uh, afterwards, but anything I put in inside this class, had I put write host in before or write information, then sure, it would be written to the host, right? But if I just kind of leave it there, kind of just leave this string here, nothing is going to happen. It's, it's going to be kind of encapsulated by that, by that method, right? So the only thing we're going to get back from the subtract method is the result of, um, of A minus B, nothing else. So with that, let's try to define some new classes. Um, probably going to make this a little bigger. Can everyone see this? Good. All right. So here again, this is very similar to the example I, I showed in the slide, right? Uh, we're using at type dash type definition, and then I just have a big here string here that defines uh, a class in C sharp. Uh, the class has a name. Uh, it has a single method called hi there. It takes a parameter um, that's a string, and then it returns me a string. And so down here, um, just going to say hello. So if I run this code. The pass-through parameter simply uh, returns the new type uh, to this uh, A-class um, variable. So if I do F8, uh, now I should be able to say an object. And we use the new key. The new keyword is a, is a partial 5.0 feature, right? Um, I could also have done uh, new objects, and then the, the full name of, uh, of the class I just defined. So now that I have an object of the type a class, so the, f the full name, since I did not uh, specify namespace, right, I could have done something like, you know, namespace, psconf, eu code, and then wrapped all of this, then the full name would have been psconf eu code dot a class, but since I did not do that, the full name of, uh, of this new type definition is simply going to be a class, right? Um, I, I wouldn't, wouldn't recommend doing it like this because if you emit all of your classes without kind of qualifying them with namespaces, you might end up uh, having naming collisions, right? Uh, but usually when you're running a PowerShell script, you know, not too much else is running. It exits at some point, you know, not too far into the future and might not be a problem. Okay, so... Now we have an object, which is an instance of this class that we just defined. And now we can call this hi there method. And let's pass the name psconf.eu in there. And it returns a string, 
hello, PS config, right? Uh, again, the return keyword returns the string to the caller. It doesn't write it to the console or to the host or anything. So I could also assign the output from this, right? Um, string. And now the a string variable contains hello PS config. Right. So this was kind of the PowerShell 2.2, 3, 4.0 kind of way of, of defining new classes or new types at runtime. In PowerShell 5, uh, as I mentioned, uh, we kind of get this new, this new grammar, uh, these new features, and this new keyword called class. So I can go in and I can say class, um, give it a name. In this case, we're implementing our, our simple calculator. Again, just has two methods. Uh, Big difference from kind of defining, defining functions in PowerShell that are kind of forgiving. They just output anything. So you don't need to kind of um, uh, be strict about what you return and what you don't return. Uh, class method needs to return what it, what it promises to return. So in this case, I'm saying that add always returns an integer when you pass it to integers, and the same with the subtract method. And so if we run this code, I can now create an, an instance of this new calculator like before. And now I can do calc, add two numbers, um, two and three, and we get the correct result five, right? And again, because it's returned to me, it's not actually written to the screen, um, I can assign that to, to a variable. And so what I just did there, right, I assigned my new object to a variable, and then I just used the dot operator to say at. This is kind of the normal way of, of invoking code, right? It calls my method. But using the power of reflection that we kind of delved into a little bit before, uh, we can also do something a, a little more funky. Uh, we can say, I'm going to give you an instance of a calculator. And I'm going to give you the name of the method that I want to call. And then, again, using reflection, um, using a type literal, and then uh, uh, calling get member, we can kind of retrieve all the members of that type. And now I can basically pass in anything, right? Because the, the get member method just takes a name, the name of the member that I'm interested in. And member, in this case, could be a method or a property or an event. And now I have a reference to that method for that type. And then I can kind of inject the object on which I want to invoke this method, and then a list of arguments. And so now if I define this function, invoke calculation, say in invoke calculation, um, I can pass in my calculator. And I can say that the operation I want it to run is at, and the arguments are two and three. And then these two operations, getting a reference to that method for that type, and then invoking it against the object that I passed in the calculator, right, uh, does the exact same thing as me calling dot at. Um, and now you might ask yourself, you know, why is this interesting, right? Why would I do that? Um, Let's see here. So does anyone here know what an interface is in the context of, of .NET C sharp programming? Anyone? Yeah? OK. So an, an, an interface is a little bit like a class, except it has no code attached. It basically says, um, uh, this type has these methods, these method names, and these method signatures, but I don't care about what code runs. I don't care about how they're implemented. I'm only interested in their behavior, what kind of parameters you need to pass to the method, and what kind of, kind of data they, they return. And so this is not supported in PowerShell, right? The PowerShell class feature is kind of a subset of what you find in C Sharp or in VB.NET. Uh, it, it kind of does the bare minimum. It allows us to extend existing types or implementing existing interfaces, but it's kind of basic in, in what it does, right? And so last year at this very conference uh, on the first day, uh, 
we were asked to do like a, a, a speaker panel, like um, ask the speakers anything on stage. And someone raised their hands and said, you know, this, this whole PowerShell 5.0 feature, it's kind of nice, I can do a bunch of interesting stuff, I can extend and implement existing types, but I can't really define interfaces at runtime. Uh, there's, some, there's some kind of software defined pattern, um, uh, software design patterns that I would like to implement in PowerShell, and I can't do that because I don't have this utility, the interface. I can't define that at runtime. And so, on stage, we had Bruce Piet, and Bruce said, you know, kind of sounds like C-sharp, and, you know, C-sharp already exists, so probably never. Um, and, you know, the, the asker was kind of disappointed about this, um, and I kind of get Bruce's uh, kind of argument here, right? There's already a language out there that does all of this, compiles perfectly, can be used in PowerShell. Why would we kind of reinvent, reinvent a, a wheel that is kind of working pretty well? Um, but the next thing I thought was like, I wonder like, how you could do that. Like, I'm not Bruce Pay yet. I'm not going to go home and, and rewrite the parser and implement new grammar for, for, uh, for interfaces in PowerShell. But it would be nice to see if it could be done, right? Like, can I maybe do something from within PowerShell? I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty powerful. We've seen it can do all of this reflection stuff, introspect against types. Maybe we can also kind of create types at runtime. So you might ask, you know, why would this be useful? Why, why would interfaces be useful in the context of PowerShell? Um, uh, in the context of classes, again, there are a bunch of software design patterns uh, that might, might be useful, but in the context, in the context of even you know, normal PowerShell, using the pipeline, defining functions, um, having the ability to both define, specify, and use interfaces is actually pretty nifty. So here we have two, uh, two literals. Um, does anyone know what the difference between these two are? Yeah? Right, okay, so in the second example, if we add more entries, they're going to be in sorted order, right? They're going to retain the order which we added them to. So the first one is a hash table, the second one is an ordered dictionary, right? Uh, they look like, they almost look the same, they kind of behave the same, with the, with the big difference that the second one retains the order in which we add uh, entries to. If we add new entries to the hash table, the keys might shuffle their order, we don't have any control over that. And so, let's say that you're writing a function that needs to take a hash table and operate on, on some of the key value pairs in that hash table. But once you're done operating on the values, you want to return that hash table to the user again in a modified form, right? I might want to say, I would like my user to be able to pass in an ordered dictionary. I mean, it's almost the same, right? It, it behaves the same. I can operate it on the same. I can iterate all of the keys. I don't care if it's a hash table or an ordered dictionary, but my user might care, right? They might want to, as you say, retain the sorted order of the keys. So if I start implementing functions that take a hash table as an input, what's going to happen is that people pass in an ordered dictionary. When I return that ordered dictionary to them, they're going to find that their keys are all shuffled, right? They're, they're in the wrong order. There's a reason for this. PowerShell employs uh, aggressive conversion on parameter binding. I think this was mentioned uh, yesterday as well, and Stefan is, is sure to mention it in, in his uh, ETS talk. When you pass an argument to a parameter in, in, uh, in PowerShell, and the parameter is not of the exact same type as the argument that you passed in, PowerShell is going to try a bunch of different things to kind of coerce your argument into being what it thinks it should be. And this is why the pipeline works so well, right? You can basically pipe anything to anything, and it, it, it kind of works either binding by name or by type. Um, and so, so what's going to happen is that it works just fine. You can pass your ordered dictionary uh, to, uh, to the function, but it's no longer an ordered dictionary, right? So then you might jump down the rabbit hole of saying, OK, maybe, maybe I accept both hash tables and ordered dictionaries. I split them into two different parameter sets, uh, and then in line I try to figure out uh, whether I was passed a, a hash table or an ordered dictionary, and then based on that I, I do whatever I need. Uh, there are two problems with this. First of all, this is getting pretty mess messy pretty fast, right? 
This was kind of simple and nice. This is not really simple anymore, and we're just like talking about taking a single parameter argument, right? The second problem with this is that it doesn't even work, because when the default parameter to set is uh, the one that takes a hash table, and we pass in an ordered dictionary, again, because PowerShell is trying to be oh so helpful, it says, oh, I know exactly how to take your ordered dictionary and turn it into a hash table, so you don't even need to worry about it. So now the user specifically needs to say, it's an ordered dictionary that I'm passing in, and the pipeline doesn't work anymore, so this is kind of annoying, right? So how might you solve this? Well, it turns out that both the order dictionary and the hash table, all of this functionality that they have in common, the reason that they look so much alike, is that they have an interface in common. They have an interface that specifies that, at, uh, that's called iDictionary, and iDictionary uh, says that a, a dictionary should always have a set of keys, an array of keys, it should have an array of values, it should allow you to index uh, into it using uh, whatever the key is, uh, and, and a bunch of other methods uh, and properties. And so, if in my parameter block, I just specify that I want an, an input object of type iDictionary, you can now pass a hash table to it, an order dictionary to it, a key value pair, uh, any type of dictionary, basically, and I'm not going to try, or PowerShell is not going to try to coerce it into another type. It's not going to try to convert it to anything because the type of a hash table and the type of an ordered dictionary all already satisfies my parameter type requirement. They are already iDictionaries. Uh, so, again, dic um, interfaces can be kind of useful not even in, uh, in the course of, of class or type development in PowerShell, but even just in you know, making the, the pipeline work nicely without you know, breaking all of your users' data. So beyond type, uh, beyond add type and beyond classes, uh, we actually have a bunch of other options for compiling code or from generating code at runtime uh, in line. Uh, most of the techniques that I'm going to kind of show you in a second uh, are adopted from uh, what we might call the bad guys. Um, uh, I work in information security, and uh, over the last couple of years, it's kind of dying, dying down now, uh, but it was very common for a kind of PowerShell to be used as an attack vector because it's very powerful, right? You can kind of hook into anything in Windows. So you drop a malware dropper on, on a box, and then you run a bunch of PowerShell scripts, and you can do all, all sorts of things. And so bad guys love in-memory compilation, right? This idea that you can... Uh, you can just kind of uh, pass a string to a PowerShell script, it compiles some code for you that does some nefarious stuff, some, some whatever they need to do, um, uh, without leaving any traces on disk. Because when you, when you call add type, what add type does is it takes your string, it writes it to a file, it calls out to a compiler against that file, and so you have all these remnants on the, on the disk of the machine. So if someone like me comes along to do you know, forensic investigation on this system, I'm going to see, ah, there's someone down here who tried to compile a bunch of code, and I can probably kind of stop them in their tracks. So in-memory compilations, hackers love this, uh, but you may find that you'll love it too, because it's actually kind of nice. So there's, um, there's, uh, there's an API in uh, .NET called uh, system.reflection.emit, um, and this API uh, we can use uh, to emit new types at runtime. Uh, this API does not emit C sharp or F sharp or VB.NET like readable code. It emits this MSIL, this intermediate language that I was talking about, that kind of the cross compilation language that uh, enables us to use all of these high level languages. So, with a bit more help from kind of these reflection features we've looked at and a bit, and a bit of trial of an error with a tool called uh, ILSpy that I'm going to show in a second, uh, I, I wanted to figure out how can I take this ability to define these interfaces, which I know how to do in C-sharp, and then figure out how to use this system.reflection.emit API to do the same thing from PowerShell, because I can call out to that API in PowerShell, right? Sure. This one right here? Yeah, 
you can do that, right? But as I was showing before, in this case where you have, you have two objects that are of type so similar that PowerShell will say, oh, I'll just convert one to the other, you may al already have lost a bunch of information during parameter binding, so that once you start operating on it in your code, you're not actually getting the truth, right? Like PowerShell has been too helpful. So when you do get type, you'll always get a hash type because, you know, the param block told PowerShell that it should try to convert everything to a, to a hash type, right? Does that make sense? So the nice thing about defining this type is that now the, f the function will accept any type that implements iDictionary, right, that exhibits the dictionary behavior that I need to operate on inside my function, but it won't accept anything else, right? So if I pass a string to it, I p pass a number to it, or anything else, it'll actually fail during parameter binding. I don't need to spend CPU time doing weird type conversion stuff, right? PowerShell can actually take care of this for me. So this is kind of why, why, why interfaces might be, might be helpful in, in defining your, your parameters. Does that make a little more sense? Yeah. Cool. So, I'm just going to zoom out a little bit here and duplicate my screen again. So this is Visual Studio, right? Um, I have a project here. I'm going to add um, a new file. Um, a new interface, and I'm going to call it interface uh, test interface. And then I can specify um, a, a method, right? A method that returns a string. It's called method. Um, it takes an argument of an integer. Um, and so this is what an interface declaration looks like in C-sharp, right? Very simple code. Just tell the name of my interface, and then the methods or the properties that I, I want this interface to, uh, to say that, that uh, the classes or types implementing this should be implementing, right? And so what I did to, to figure out how to do this is I took this code, I compiled it into a DLL, just the simplest example I could come up with, and then um, I opened this tool called ILSpy. Um, I think I maybe need to zoom in a little bit, if it can do that. It doesn't seem to be able to do that. I'm going to read off here. Uh, basically, you load your DLL, you load the code that you've compiled into ILSpy, um, and then it'll show you what it'll try to do it, is it'll take all of this IMSL that is inside the DLL, and it'll try to figure out what that would look like in C Sharp. So it's trying to kind of reverse engineer the structure of this IMSL and figure out what might that look like if, if you were to, uh, to implement it in C Sharp. And so here, um, I have one of these interfaces that I defined in C Sharp, and you can see here, yeah, it kind of looks like what I would write in C Sharp. It looks like the tool is doing a pretty good job. Here's, a, here's kind of a method that I defined. This is from an, an early example, so the signature is a little different. But the nice thing about uh, ILSpy is that up here, I can choose what language I wanted to decompile my code to. So instead of me looking at like a C sharp representation of the assembly, I can go down and I can say, I want the intermediate language representation of this. And as you saw, all of a sudden, the code over on the right here, I know it's very small, um, there's just like two lines up there right now. If I go down and, and select the aisle instead, it becomes a little more complex. There's a bunch of keywords up here. All of a sudden, it became the method itself became method public hide by sig new slot abstract virtual instance void method still managed. Uh, maybe not as readable as the C sharp, but this is what the C sharp compiler turned my code into. And this is something that the CLR, right, the .NET runtime, can understand and interpret. And so I looked at I looked at I looked at these signatures. I looked at these keywords. Looked at the interface. Yeah, okay, so an interface is kind of class. It's kind of an abstract class. Um, it has to be public and it has a name. And so what I went back and did is um, I think there was a link in the slide deck to a project called PS Reflect uh, by Matthew Graber. Um, and he was using this system.reflection.emit uh, technique. 
And so I basically took this technique and I said, okay, let me use this to define a class and then try to prop all of these uh, attributes that an, 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 that an interface seems to have based on the IL that I get from, from this tool. So I threw this into PowerShell function and is this readable somewhat? Right. So this is kind of a step-by-step -step builder approach. Um, we define a name for our, for our assembly that's required. Uh, we create something called an assembly builder from the app domain. The app domain is a little bit, bit like the run space in PowerShell. The app domain is kind of the thing that holds all the code and all the modules in, in your .NET runtime. So from the app domain, we create an assembly builder. From the assembly builder, we create a module builder using the uh, defined dynamic uh, module method. Then using our module builder, we can define a new type. When we call define type, we get an object back um, called a, a type builder. And so basically, I think up here you can see public, interface, abstract, ANSI class, and auto layout. I got all of these from just kind of looking at this reverse engineers, engineered IL, right? They just said, okay, the interface keyword, that's kind of obvious, public, that's kind of obvious, auto, I'm not sure, ANSI, I'm not sure and then just tried a bunch of different things until I got the exact same type signature in IL Spy for both the thing that I'd, I'd compiled in, in Visual Studio and using PowerShell. And so down by the end, uh, down here, I get this, uh, this type builder that has the interface name and the interface uh, attributes, and now all I need is to define the methods and the properties attached to this interface. Now, before I show how it's done, I'm just going to show what legislator actually looks like, how you know, the user experience is. So, um, import module legislator. If we do get command module legislator, we'll see that we, we have four functions, uh, event, interface, method, and property. Uh, interface is kind of the core of this. This is what we were looking at uh, just before. And then um, I decided that methods and properties, we definitely want to support that in our, in our interface definitions because that's what PowerShell classes uh, implement. Uh, the event function or the ability to, to uh, define events in our, in our interfaces was kind of a, you know, this would be fun to try. I don't really see a use case for it in PowerShell because PowerShell classes don't support declaration of events, but um, yeah, why not? I was kind of into it anyways. So I have these, I have these uh, four methods, and the way they kind of go together is a little bit like the C-sharp syntax. So you just go interface. Um, we're going to do a simple example. We're going to define the interface for a car. So we call this iCar. By convention in .NET, every single interface is prefixed by i, so you can kind of distinguish them from, um, from non-interface types. And then this is where it gets a little bit different. Um, because this is a PowerShell DLL and there's no, um, there's no kind of grammar uh, for defining these uh, interfaces natively, introduce this method keyword. Uh, the method keyword takes a return type, uh, so uh, that could be a string, um, and then it takes a method name, and since it's a car, it should be able to drive. I mean, that would be pretty nice. And then, it takes an array of parameters. In this case, we're not going to pass any parameters to it, but um, in the calculator example before, we'd say something like int, int. There's currently no support for naming these arguments in the interface. Uh, this is kind of a, a next thing, but uh, this is kind of the, the easiest way I could implement this using the grammar that PowerShell already has, right? Because PowerShell needs to pass this as a function. So in this case, we just have um, an empty array. We don't need to pass any parameters to drive. You know, just get in there and drive. So now I defined this iCar interface, and you may say, well, did that even do anything? Well, yes, it actually did something. If I do iCar, I now have a new type in my app domain that I did not have before. So now, by the magic of this system.reflection.emit API, I was able to actually define an interface just from PowerShell without you know, modifying anything in the language. So what could I use this for? Well, using the classes feature from before, I can now, take, uh, I can now do a no new class definition that implements this interface. And this might look something like this. I would like to uh, define a Ferrari class, and I would like that it implements the iCar interface. 
And now, if I just do this, it's going to throw me an error, saying that error during the creation of type Ferrari, method drive in type Ferrari does not have an implementation. And this is back to the fact that I'm mandating that it needs to implement all the methods that are defined in my iCar interface. And so PowerShell fully supports the, the implementation of interfaces, right? Just not the definition of it. So if we go back and we say, um, so the return type string, drive, and then supply a method body to it. And we do something like return. That's what a Ferrari sounds like, right? And so now I can, you know, I can create an instance of my Ferrari. Um, and rum, perfect. All right, but you know, maybe not everyone can afford a Ferrari, so you know, let's uh, let's implement a Nissan as well. Nissans don't say rum, so do something like this. Now, since both my Ferrari and my Nissan implement the iCar interface, I can now start devising functions or other classes that take an iCar as its parameter, right? So now, if I do function drive car, I know it's not an, appro an approved verb, but this will do for now. In my param block, I say that I take an iCar as the only argument, and then down here. And what you'll see now, because I've, I've declared that the, the car parameter is of type iCar, PowerShell gives me tab completion, because PowerShell can, again, use reflection to introspect that iCar has a drive interface, so anything that is an iCar must necessarily have a drive method. So now I can do car drive, and when I do drive car, and pass my Nissan to it. Um, oh, I didn't create it. Nissan. So, drive car, Nissan. Brrr. And drive car Ferrari, once again. Rum. So here, I think you saw it in the editor as well. You'll get this as well if you do this in partial IC or, uh, or VS Code. Just from having the interface declaration with these defined methods, you actually get a bunch of nice development features like auto-completion, IntelliSense, all of these things. But also, you get type safety already during parameter binding. Because if I now try to say, you know, um, the car is the number one, two, three, PowerShell is actually going to throw me an error during parameter binding. So I don't get into, I don't actually get into start executing my functions, spending a lot of CPU cycles before calling the drive method and then figuring out that, oops, a number doesn't have a drive method, right? Uh, so again, this is kind of nice for, for types of safety even outside the, um, uh, the use case of classes in PowerShell. Um, there, let me just see here. Right, so the way that all of this works, the way that the method, uh, event, and property functions work is that um, this is basically a DSL, right? This is a domain-specific language just written in PowerShell. And all it is is the command name itself, right? Interface, the name, icar, and then a script block. And the script block that I pass in just contains all the method calls to method property event. And so what I'm doing First, during parameter binding, I'm validating that the only, the, uh, the only commandlets or the only statements inside the script block are either the method, uh, property, or, or event. I don't, want, I don't want people to pollute kind of the interface declaration with anything else. And then down here, I just dot source the definition. Because the method and property and event methods know that they're just going to look for this dollar legislator variable in apparent scope, and then they're going to add themselves, they're going to add the method and property definitions to dollar legislator. So by the time we get down here, we've dot source definition, all the code from uh, method, property, and event has run. Legislator has been populated, uh, or the, the, the type builder has been populated um, by all of these nice things. 
And so by the end, we call create type. Uh, this emits the type, uh, throws it into the app domain, and this is why I can now do you know, square brackets icar, and I have my interface. Uh, finally, the method just, if you, again, if you call the pass-through parameter, it'll give you back the icar, so it's kind of a little bit like add type, right? Um, so, in summary, I mentioned this yesterday as well, PowerShell, if we look at the type system, if, if we kind of look at some of the, the built-in functionality, uh, PowerShell, in some ways, are .NET++, right? It gives you a bunch of stuff on top of all the niceties that we already get from .NET, making it super, super easy to use. Uh, .NET already has a pretty powerful type system. Um, and again, with these APIs, like the system.reflection.emit API has been there since .NET 1.1. So uh, this idea of kind of strong support for reflection also gives us a lot of flexibility in even extending kind of this powerful type system further. Um, in PowerShell, as, as you probably know already, most of this magic is completely transparent to you, but I hope to have maybe like opened the lid a little bit to what might be going on under the hoods. Um, yeah, reflection is powerful, and anything is possible, sort of. Next up, uh, if you found this, this topic or these themes interesting, you don't have to have found me interesting. Uh, I'd strongly recommend you go to uh, Jared Atkinson's session later today uh, about PS Reflect, Reflection in general, and how to interact with native APIs in Windows. Um, and when you get back home, as I mentioned before, I'd strongly encourage you to watch uh, Stefan's uh, talk on the extended type system. It is no doubt way better than mine. Um, finally, uh, if you thought this was interesting or the concept of interfaces might be interesting to something you're doing, a project you're, you're working on, or some problems you've seen with PowerShell, feel free to play with it. Feel free to reach out to me. Let me know if, if you have any feature requests or you think it's stupid or nice or something that could be done better. And keep exploring.